What I want to do is really just talk a bit about the project and for, for me what is probably the most surprising outcome that I hadn't anticipated from the project. It's an ARC project funded through the um, Discovery Scheme. Um, it, we've nearly got $500,000 for three years and I'm the sole CI on that project. What we're trying to do is develop up about 32 case studies um, of successful remote schools. Uh, we've got to 31, so we've only got one more to do, um, but we had a volunteer working on the project, so we might do a few more that are a little bit unique um, because we've, I think we've reached saturation point in trying to get remote and very remote schools, but there are some unique schools, particularly in Queensland, that would be very similar to schools in Western Australia, for example. In Western Australia, they're classified as remote, but in Queensland, they're classified provincial because they're close to a major centre, but for all other intents and purposes, they're exactly like a remote school. So I'll probably include some of those. All of the schools in the study are, are either remote or very remote, as classified by um, the My Schools website. So we've used the My Schools website a lot um, for making definitions because it's uh, something that's external to us um, and that sort of alleviates a lot of other issues we have. All the schools have at least 80% Indigenous learners because there are schools um, say like Birdsville or Bullia or Yalara, which are very remote schools, but they are predominantly non-Indigenous or totally non-Indigenous kids. So we are looking at what, basically what we're look, trying to find out is what's working in these schools. Um, we're using success in a very, because you saw that in the title. Um, we're defining success in one of two ways. So success is either the NAPLAN data, which I have problems with, but it is a, nationally, a national benchmark. So we use that as one criteria. But we also asked, have asked all the different authorities, if you've got a school that you think should be included, or if other people recommend that school to us, we will go to that school. And I'll give you one example. Um, one of the schools we've worked at in the Northern Territory is a boarding school. It was established by the local community who actually wanted the kids out of community because the community was highly dysfunctional. So they wanted the kids to go somewhere to a boarding school in a safe, a safe place out of community. Now their NAPLAN data is terrible. Um, but the kids are coming in at secondary school, often working at a grade one or two level. And if they can get the kids to come for the whole year of boarding, they can actually add three years on to their numeracy scores. So those kids will advance three years in one year. So they're the sort of benchmarks we're also using for success. So we're not just looking at are these kids working at benchmark? So we're also looking at value adding as well. So if we use schools, uh, no, I shouldn't say that. All schools have to provide us with some data to show that they're successful, however success is defined. We've just finished one case study in New South Wales. Their case study is about working with Indigenous kids who have um, disabilities. And so they're working significantly behind or below the benchmark and they've developed a whole agricultural farm and all of the maths is in context. So they're actually, those kids are actually learning maths and at the same time they're training them up to be able to get jobs on farms. So that's another way that we're sort of defining success. So we're very open in terms of how we're defining success. We have had one school that we didn't include in the study because they couldn't provide us with a measure that we could say they are being successful on. Um, so we are a little bit selective as well. So the intent of the project is, I think is really simple. And I, I often wonder, basically when we got the ARC grant, um, we only missed out on about $20,000, which is an unusual amount because it was such a high amount. And I think the project is because it's a simple project. Um, and in the application, what I did say was we'd just com completed a project in the Kimberley where we as the expert went in and worked with the schools and told them this is a way to work. Um, and in the end, we found that project really didn't work because after two years of a three year project, all of the teachers moved on. And of the 32 teachers we started with, there are only three teachers left. So how is that sustainable? So I was a little bit critical highly critical of my own work, um, but also it was where the um, inquiry into the closing the gap, the Senate inquiry into the closing of the gap had been released um, and it had been embargoed and under the Freedom of Information Act it had to be released. And what came out of that was they were saying even though they'd spent, and I can't remember the exact amount, one billion or 11 billion, but whatever it is, it was too much money for me to even comprehend. But what they said in that report was that with all of that money being invested in education, housing and health, the outcomes were either minimal or negative. 
So there's a lot of money that's being spent on interventions that aren't working. So in the application for the project, what I said was, let's work with schools that are working. Let's work with teachers who are doing a good job because there's so much negative press around schools that aren't working, kids that aren't working, kids that aren't coming to school. We know a lot about the negatives, but we don't actually know a lot about the positives. So this project is really about documenting what is working so that we can actually start to see what's happening in these schools. Um, and what we're doing is we're developing up case studies. So when we go to a site, we actually develop up a case study of that school. The school might tell us, and we ask the school to tell us the warts and all, but we only focus on the positives. So what is actually working on that school? So if they, and we use the example of attendance, it's not much point writing that school X has great attendance when we actually know it doesn't, because if they do have poor attendance and somebody knows that, reads the report, they'll dismiss that case study as well as dismiss the whole project. So we do ask the schools to tell us the, the issues, the problems, the challenges at that school, but we do not write them into the report, but we write the report around the context of that school. So what we're trying to do is two things. One is to celebrate the work of those schools, the teachers. Often when, we, and as Peter said, I took um, time off to work in a remote school. Um, it was when I took the job up, people told me I was a bit crazy because apparently it was the most dysfunctional school in the state. Um, but it was a challenge um, because the, the project in the Kimberley hadn't worked and I really wanted to understand, well, what are the circumstances for remote Indigenous education? Um, so when you're working in these contexts and you're dealing with many of the issues day in, day out, it's sometimes you lose sight of what you're being successful at. So what we're trying to do is to celebrate to the, with the school about what they're doing well. So that's one of our goals. The other one is to share with other schools to say, here's school X, this is what they're doing, to give them examples of what they may be doing. So all of the case studies are very contextual. They're about what's happening at this school. So another school <coughs> can say, well, this is what we need to do. And we write them um, in a lot of detail. So one school we went to, a lot of teachers might say, look, it's too hard to do group work. Indigenous kids like to work on their own um, and they like to do this. I've tried group work, it doesn't work. And so at this one school, the teacher said, it took me three months to get the, the whole group work um, processes working in the classroom, but it was worth it because now the kids know how to do group work. So we write that detail in to the report. So another teacher can read it and say, I think I'll try group work, try it a couple of times, it doesn't work but they've got enough detail to say, you've actually got to work at it a little bit longer than a couple of weeks. So that level of detail is in all of the reports. We're at a point now, as I said, we've done 31 case studies um, and we're at a point now we can start to see, I don't want to say tr a, a trend across all the schools because that's actually not the case. And one of the things I was very um, wary of with the project was I don't want to come out of this project and say something like, direct instruction is the way to go. I don't think that works because every school, every community, every teacher is very different. So what we need to do is look at things like, and that's what I want to talk about it today, is things that seem to be working across many of the schools. They might have different forms, but the intent behind them is really important. So that's what we're looking at. Um, but we, one of the things we stress to the schools, we're here to describe what you do and not to evaluate. Um, so for example, we did go into a school that does do a direct instruction. I personally have problems with uh, direct instruction, but we described what they did around their direct instruction approach. So we don't go to evaluate. Um, but I think here's where we are now to look at the trends and differences across those schools. So if you imagine it's a bit like now a Venn diagram, we've got some schools doing this, some schools doing this, this school does this, but it doesn't do this. So it's all over, it's, it's, it's becoming a nice story now. So that's the intent of our project. When we think about the context of Indigenous education, particularly in remote areas, most of the schools are staffed by early career teachers. Either they're brand new graduates who have never taught and have never taught in a remote context. So they're dealing with a number of um, their own identities really, like be becoming a teacher and becoming a teacher in a remote context. And I'll give you a, a nice little example. We work with one teacher. When they come to the school, they're given the list. Um, it's in the wet season, so often the school is totally isolated. The teachers have flown in. Um, supplies may only come in once a week and usually they're the emergency supplies like um, milk, uh, diesel to run the generators and so on. And she, get, she got the list of all she had to bring in. She bought it in um, and in her first week of school she had dreadlocks and she got knits. 
um, but she never had any knit cream, so she didn't know what to do. Her friends are ringing up on Saturday night from Melbourne. They're all going out nightclub clubbing, and she's got p kids picking the knits out of her hair. Now, I mean, that's, that kind of encapsulates some of the issues that teachers are dealing with when they go remote if they've come from a big city. So they're dealing with those issues, and there's often a high turnover of teachers in very remote schools. Um, when I was in the Territory, the average stay of a teacher was three months. The average stay of a principal was 12 months. I had teachers who, who would come in. Um, they'd get off the plane and they'd hop on the next plane back. I had teachers who would go home for the school holidays and they just couldn't come back. They'd ring me on Sunday and they said, I just can't hop on the plane. And so we've got to try and find somebody to take those classes. And in a one, we had a uh, our school was spread over three different communities, one teacher in each community. Those kids didn't have a teacher until we could get another teacher into that school. So the, there's a very high turnover of teachers. I think systems are getting a little bit better on how they're dealing with that, cultural in, in, um, induction, um, all of those sorts of things prior to the teachers going into the communities. Um, the Indigenous people in most of the communities we've worked in are generally more in a support role, so they're working as, and the acronyms are numerous, they're working in support roles generally as a support person for the teacher. And the diversity in those roles is phenomenal, going from some schools where they will not employ an Indigenous person through to other schools where the Indigenous person is a co-teacher with the teacher. So, I mean, we've captured that diversity across the study. The other thing um, is we've got new teachers coming in, teachers who are struggling becoming a teacher and teachers who may be struggling with the whole cross-cultural work that's being done. Professional development is really difficult to access. Getting teachers to fly out for a two-day workshop might actually mean they're out of school for a week. There's no relief teachers in those schools, so what does the school do when the teacher flies out for a week? Flying professional development in is also very expensive because you're getting a consultant who might have to take two days to get there um, and be in school for two days and two days out. So you're paying a consultant six days for two days work. So professional development is often difficult to access for that reason. Um, and across our study, we have got schools ranging from a one teacher school through to schools that are almost um, what you'd find in um, a small, in a city area um, with you know 10 teachers working across P to 10, P to 12. Um, we've covered all of the sectors of schooling ranging from the state to the Catholics to the independents. Um, we've got them from early years right through to um, we've just finished our first vet school. So we have covered the gamut and we've done that with some intent um, to try and capture the, the diversity of those practices. If we just looked at primary, we might not have captured the other work that's been, the, the other good work that's been done. So just to give you some um, idea of where we are, um, we've gone into different states. The sad part of our study is we've got permission from every other state that has got remote and very remote schools. So we haven't gone to Victoria and we haven't gone to Tasmania for obvious reasons. The Northern Territory um, State Department of Education was the only uh, department that's refused us entry. So that's why we haven't got any, which is really sad um, when we look at the demographics of the Northern Territory. That's not to say, and I make a point of that, that's not to say there's not great work happening in the Territory. There is. It's just that we haven't got permission to go into those schools. Um, what's been interesting for us, though, across the study um, is that you can see we've got a skewed distribution, not that it's a scientific study. Um, we've got a skewed distribu distribution to Western Australia and I think that's for two reasons. One is that many of the schools on the um, My Schools website for Western Australia have been classified as remote and very remote, although schools in Queensland uh, are very similar but they haven't been classified as remote or very remote. That's why we're going to include some more schools in Queensland because they do meet the same criteria except that on the uh, my school sites they aren't classified in that way. Um, so we are getting very close to completing the study. So what we're doing is we're doing what we call an ethnographic case study. So basically it's coming to the school, um, we, we interview the leadership team in the school so we get the big picture. We try to do the, the leadership team first. In one school, the one teacher school, the leader was, the, the principal was also the teacher. So, we, you know, that was an easy one to do. But we want to try and get a, bit, a big picture of what's going on at the school. We interview the teachers, we interview support staff, um, we interview the AEWs, anyone who's interested in being interviewed, we include. We have included community members as well, and a lot depends on the context again. Um, we observe the lessons. What we really, and we do a 
productive pedagogy is rating on those lessons. What we're really looking for is the principal or the leadership team says this, the teachers say this, and then we observe it in the classroom. And we've seen that across a lot of our studies. In some of the study sites that are a little bit um, harder to write, the principal say this, the teachers say most of that, and then you see some of that in the classroom. So when we write those case studies up, what we write up is where we see that synergy. We develop individual case studies, um, and they've, um, if you go to the uh, website, which is hosted through um, CERC, um, you can see all the case studies. Um, from ethics, we weren't allowed to, as you know, we're not allowed to name schools or anything. When we started the project, the principals actually wanted the schools to be named because they wanted the, us to know that it was, and I'll give the name of a school like Kolkaria, they wanted you to know that it was Kolkaria and not Luma from down the road. They wanted to be named. We went back to ethics and we got, after much negotiation, we got permission to have the, the schools named. Anything else coming out of the report, all the, ident all the usual ethical stuff, um, is as you'd expect. So where we are now is we're at this developing, developing um, the macro analysis of the project. Um, we're using Invo, Evo, so all of the um, interviews have been coded um, in Invivo. We're using LexiMansa and hopefully that will pro provide us with a synergy between those two analysis. And from the productive pedagogies, we'll be um, doing a stats analysis on that as well. Okay, so this is where we were. So when I started the project, what I was thinking we would be doing was going into classrooms and looking at what teachers are doing and developing up some really practical guides about what teachers do. Maybe that was my naivety. Maybe that was my personal fo uh, focus on going into classrooms. But having interviewed so many people, and I'm not sure how many we've interviewed. Have you got any idea, Alana? It's hundreds, absolutely hundreds of people. What I'm starting to see is we've got to have a three-tiered model. Um, we went into one school, for example, as we went into the school, the kids are saying, oh, welcome to our school. This is a great school. We're the happiest school in the world. I think, oh, yeah, sure. Okay, so the next kid says the same. And then you go into the staff office, the main office, and they say, oh, welcome to our school. We're the happiest school in the world. And it's the, we, I've never come across that before. But when we interviewed the... Um, leadership team, what they said was when they came to the school, there was a big divide. The school gate was here, the kids stayed there and no one really came into school. So they did a SWOT, they got a consultant in, a consultant in, do a, did a SWOT analysis, found out the, the, the community said, we don't like going to that school. They're growly, they're not happy, um, all of those sorts of things. So they, what they realised, what they had to do was change the culture of the school. They had to make it be a happy place where the kids wanted to come. And so for me, that really challenged me in that I wasn't now thinking, I didn't have to think now about classrooms, I had to think bigger. So we've developed this model um, where we're looking at the envisaged practices. So it's kind of what's, what's the vision of the school? What are they doing at this school? We went to another school, for example, um, and they've just said, what we have to do is look after student wellbeing. If the students haven't got shoes or they haven't got lunches or if they haven't got, it's our role to make sure that those kids um, can come to school. If they can't hear, we've got to get an, um, the hearing guys in. If they can't do this, so it's really about the well-being of the student and then everything else follows. Interestingly, both of those schools said, we do not have a numeracy program yet. We're working on that. That's our next level of working on. So what we've found is that we have to look at what are the envisaged practices of the school? So the project was, what, what are the practices at successful schools? So we've got the, the, the macro, the envisaged practices, the enabling practices. So what's actually enabling these schools to do what they want to do? And this is what I thought we'd be looking at, is what actually happens at the level of the classroom. So what I want to do is, I've given a little bit of this and a little bit of this, but what I want to do now is talk about this middle, this middle level, because I think this is the one for me that's been the biggest surprise. So where we are now in terms of our in vivo analysis, so we've got um, one person who's now coding all of the data and so she's really familiar with the data. I go back and I double check her coding from time to time to make sure I'd agree with it so we, we are getting consistency. And you can, what you can see is these are the most commonly occurring themes that are coming out from the data. Now not all of the in vivo data is been coded yet, we're probably only about halfway through that, but what you can see is the numeracy leadership is coming out as a really important theme from the study. Now that's not to say all schools have numeracy leadership, but many of the schools do. So this is where that Venn diagram starts to come in. And you can also see there's stuff about Aboriginal workers and so on. So these are what I think are our 
most important topics that are coming out of the project. So what I want to do now is focus on that numeracy leadership. What does that actually mean in, in the schools? So in terms of the middle leaders, um, what are, what, what's happening with the middle leaders? Are they, see, they seem to be the conduit between the envisaged practice and the enacted practice. So principals can have ideas, and we've seen this in some schools where they don't have a numeracy leader or a mediator between what the leadership want, team wants and what actually happens in the classroom. The leadership team will have something in a strategic plan, but it's not actually reflected in what happens in the classroom. And one of the um, sites we refused to, well, I shouldn't say, we didn't write their case study because what happened was the leadership team, which we interviewed first, and there was, I don't know, six of them, um, they said this is all the stuff they're doing. And when we talked to the teachers and when we went into the classroom, it was a very, very different story. So what we see with the middle leaders is that they're the conduit between what the uh, leaders want and what actually happens in the classroom. Um, they provide scaffolding for the teachers, which has been really important. So going back to what I said at the start, the teachers are all new to teaching. Now, if they're in a mainstream school, they would have a mentor. Um, they would have somebody who's looking after them. They would have a lot of stuff that was given to them in terms of support. So the middle leader actually provides a lot of support and I think Tom will back me on this one, um, is most primary school teachers, their least favourite subject to teach is mathematics. So they might be really good at literacy and a whole lot of other things, but come to maths, it's one of those areas that they've tried to avoid. Um, so when they come into a remote context, having a support to do the mathematics is really important. How do you teach mathematics to Indigenous kids, and because these schools are remote, in many of the schools, the kids might speak their home language, they might speak Creole, they might speak Aboriginal English, and then they might speak English. So the school that I was in, English was actually a foreign language. The only, pla the only place they spoke English was at school or if they went into Alice Springs. So it's a bit like if we were learning, for me, if I were learning maths in French, how would I make sense of it? So the um, numeracy um, leader has to work through those sorts of things. How do you teach mathematics to kids for whom English is not their home language? The also, the, we found the, lead, the middle leader provides feedback to the leadership team. So if teachers are struggling with things or teachers needed more support, they could go back to the leadership team and put a case forward that teachers needed more time for planning or they needed more support with the data that they were doing and so on. They also um, often, what we found was the, with the really good middle leaders is that they'd been in community for a while. So they often had good links with community. So they knew what communities wanted and then they could build that into the program as well. What we have picked up in the study is that many communities are change weary. A uh, new principal comes in, we're going to do this. Um, okay, they try that, we're going to have program XYZ. The next principal comes in and says, they, they were doing a lousy job, we're going to try program ABC. And so the, 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 the families are kind of getting a little bit sick of it. They just want to know what their kids are doing. So what they're trying to do is make sense of what are the community needs, wants, expectations and building that into the program. What we've found in num a number of the schools, some of the schools are very keen to have a lot of culture into the school. Other schools have said, culture is our business, you do school business. And then that gives the um, numeracy leader scope about what they can do and the parameters of their work. Um, and also, uh, many of the numeracy leaders are also building the, um, the skills of the the local people in terms of how they teach maths. How do you run small groups? So they're actually teaching the local people, the AEWs, the teacher support people, on how to actually work with a group of kids rather than in some of the schools we've seen just yelling out in language or doing discipline. So they actually become a very integral part of the, the teaching process. And that's falling back onto the middle leaders. So what are the characteristics we've found of the good middle leaders um, is, um, it's not going to be surprising for Tom, is that most of the middle, good middle leaders, and I'm going to, I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean when I say good middle leaders, they have strong mathematical content knowledge. So they know mathematics. Because if you can see relationships in mathematics, you don't have to teach fractions and then decimals um, and then percentages because they're all, into, they're, they're, they're all tied together. And if you can see those relationships, you're not teaching three content areas, you're teaching about part number. So if they can see that, then they're much better off. They also have strong what we call pedagogical content knowledge. They know how to teach 
number. They know how to teach chance and data. They know how to teach the difference between decimals and um, percentages. They know that. They also have a strong sense of how do you differentiate for learning. In most of the communities we've been into, in say in a small school, there might be only two teachers in the school and they're teaching four or five different year levels, but within that year level there's considerable diversity, often based on attendance. So kids who are regular attenders often are working at benchmark and kids who are sporadic attenders or fairly transient, they're working considerably lower than what they are. So they have to have good knowledge for differentiating, but also good differentiating without bringing shame to the kids. So that if kids are working on number, then I might be working on um, the one to ten numbers, but somebody else might be, as is often the case, working on thousands or millions or billions. So how do you in a classroom differentiate so all the kids can be learning about number, but without one kid being shamed? Um, so they need to bring that in as well. The other thing is um, they have to build trust, respect and autonomy amongst the cohort of people we're working with. What we have found is, when I said it before, about good middle leaders. The good middle, there are a lot of schools that have bought into this idea that middle leaders are important for all of the reasons I've just said. But in many of the schools, what we've found, particularly the smaller schools, a teacher might come into the community. They might be there for one or two years um, and there's a bit of a turnover. So that teacher now has been in school for two years. They be, might become the numeracy leader and the next year they may become the principal. That wouldn't happen in mainstream. There'd be a lot more support about that. So um, what we found in one school, for example, which allowed us to see, allow, allows us to see other things, is that the numeracy leader didn't have these things. So she wasn't getting the respect from the other people in the school, although she had the title. So good, that's why I'm saying good numeracy leaders have these characteristics. What we've found across the study, um, and again it comes back to what are the characteristics of people who are working in remote communities, um, what we've found is many of the schools have a consistent approach. So what I was saying before, many communities are change weary. Um, there's just been People come into a lot of remote communities and they use it as a stepping stone. So I'll come into this remote community, I'll get my principalship here and then I'll apply for a principalship in the, big, in the bigger towns nearby or back into the city. So they're using it as a stepping stone and they've got to prove that they've implemented change and there's been a difference. So even if there were a good practice beforehand, they'll just wipe it. Um, and then to say, no, that's not what I'm doing, I'm going to do something else. And, it's, and it can be quite different. So I can imagine for the families and community, oh, here we go, new principal, new change. And that happened when I left my school. One of the staff who had been in the school for 10 years, she said, oh my God, we're going to get another principal, we're going to get something different again. And I think that is pretty much the case. So what they're looking for is a common and consistent approach to teaching mathematics. So that the kids, when they come into Tom's class, they know exactly what a maths lesson is going to be. And then when they go into anyone, the next person's class, they know what maths is going to look like. They know that this is the structure of a maths lesson. And so one of the best case studies that I think we've done, if you want to have a look at it, it's the Bamaga School, which is at the tip, tip of Australia. What they do is they have a two hour maths lesson. Now, how many schools would have a two hour maths block, Tom? Not many. Most, most teachers will say you can only teach kids at an hour for maths. And if you've got Aboriginal kids, they won't even last that long. But this school has a two hour maths block, but it's very, very carefully structured. How so long is that numeracy? Two hours? Um, sorry, for literacy. Li yeah, for, sorry, I anticipated what well, that's what you yeah. mean. Two hours for literacy, and this is common nearly across all of the schools. Two hours for literacy, then they'll have a numeracy block, which in many schools is only an hour, but this school is a two hour block. And then the last hour of the day is for everything else. Um, that's, and that's how they're working. Because many of the schools in this study are saying literacy and numeracy are the most important things. If the kids exit from the school and they're not literate and numerate, it doesn't matter about history or geography or science. So, so what this school did though, they, they said, um, because many of the things that we do in school are not actually practised in community. Um, so if you're, if you're talking, say, Pit and Jara, the counting system is one, two, three, big mob. So how do you teach place value? How do you teach operations with that? Um, so um, what they're doing is they're, they're trying to work with the issues. So a lot of the things that happens in mainstream areas aren't reinforced in the home or in the community. So what they do is they'll have a, 
an, a block which is about consolidation. So it's stuff that we've done yesterday, it's stuff we may have done last week, it's stuff that we're going to do in the next lesson and it's stuff that you need to know. So we might do some number work, we might do something on measurement, we might do something on percentages and we might do something on something else. Um, but it's always a very fast pace and the kids are really involved. So it's, we're, we're, we're practicing our number facts, we're talking about the numbers we did and it's a nice pace. So the kids actually get engaged and they argue it's revision and consolidation, but it also it's a fast pace and they'll argue it gets the brain into a maths frame. Then they might do some um, number work. So that will be like basic number facts. Um, and nearly all of the schools, in fact, I could say all of the schools have a very heavy emphasis on number. Because if they can, kids can get number, then they can apply it to the other context. So then there'll be a lot of work on number. So they will be just number facts and depending again on where the kids are and how they differentiate, um, they'll have number facts. And they'll do that again very differently uh, depending on the school. But it could be a whole lot of facts are going up and they've got to answer them on a PowerPoint or using the electronic whiteboard. But they did that all with digital media because I'll say the digital media switches the kids on. If we do it in a boring way, the kids disengage, whereas the digital media has a nice pace to it. Then they would do, so in the consolidation, they, might, they may have been talking about um, conversions between centimetres and metres. And that would have been a catalyst, a prompt for the kids because the lesson now is about something to do with length. So that what's happened is they've said the kids have had success in the con consolidation part of the lesson and once they've had that consolidation, they are familiar with it, they've had success in there so that they then can come into the main part of the lesson and they know what the lesson's about and they can make that transition easy. And then the last part of the lesson is usually doing something in digital media because they said the kids are just so engaged when you use a digi the digital media. So there's this con totally consistent approach. So every kid in that school knows whether you're in grade prep or through to grade 10, this is what a maths lesson looks like. And every maths lesson is done in the same way. Teachers have flexibility in if they allocate 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 25 minutes to different segments. They've got that flexibility depending on what's happening with the kids, but that's the structure of the lesson. So the numeracy coach's role is to induct teachers into that process. Um, so, and they, they then, what they, at this school, what they did was they provide exemplars of the work on how to do that. Um, I'll probably go through this a little bit, bit uh, quickly. But what they also did was, was, as a new teacher who came in, they gave the teacher the first four weeks of the program. So as the new teacher coming in to, say, let's just say it's Bamagar, they've never been out of Brisbane, they've got the first four weeks, not only do they have the planning done for them, but the planning's done in the model that the school wants them to plan in. So they're getting in inducted into all of the uh, facets that they needed to do. They provide a lot of teaching feedback so that they'll come into the classroom and if the teacher isn't getting the explicit approach that we're using or the way that the teachers wanted to use they've given feedback on it um, so that they can build that approach better. Um, they model it to the teachers as well. They also in every school that we've worked in they use data and again that comes back to um, Dif being able to differentiate because what has happened in the past I'm going to teach this lesson whether you know it or not um, so all of the schools are using data and using that data then to differentiate to the needs of the students so teaching is very targeted um, so they support the teacher in how to understand the data and then to build approaches that are um, commensurate with what the students needs are um, and the development of differentiated learning uh, which is really important and keeping the, the consistent approach going across the school. So what I want to do is just go back to that table at the very start. When you look at that table, I've cro now I've crossed out a couple of things on that table, but all of these things are what the numeracy coach, all of these topics are what the numeracy coach is actually working with in terms of the teacher. So how do they actually talk through the language issues that students may be having? Um, so in some languages, they might say, you may, we might say, uh, which, which number's bigger, that, what number is bigger, um, which one comes first, those sorts of things that we're doing comparatives with. In many Aboriginal languages, there aren't comparatives. So they might say, which fella him come first, meaning which one's bigger. Um, so how do you actually get concepts of comparison in, into the, the, the lesson. And if you don't know what the home language is or how it's spoken in Creole, then you might be missing a whole lot of teaching um, 
opportunities. So in many language, Aboriginal languages, for example, the term less or the concept of less is not there. So when we're saying in, in, in all of maths is usually some sort of comparison, which number is too more, which number is too less, which, which is more, which is less. So if they haven't got a concept of the, the term less, then they're probably missing half the maths lesson. And now if teachers aren't aware of that, then how do you teach that? Um, so they've got to do the scaffolding around the language. I've talked a little bit about the grouping. Um, high expectations is really important. And again, that's, that's nearly across all of the schools we're working with, is having high expectations of the Indigenous learners rather than using deficit thinking. So these are the types of topics that the numeracy coaches actually work with the teachers in terms of what they're doing. Getting teachers to think about um, how to work in these contexts. Every teacher we spoke to um, in the study, in their pre-service training, they had little to no preparation for working in remote Indigenous schools. So it does fall back on having a numeracy person in the school to think about what are the numeracy implications for working with Indigenous kids. And this, so these are many of the topics that, the, that they're working with. So one of the things, I'm just going to finish up on, the, on this because I did want to um, leave space for questions. One of the big challenges though is that those schools that are using numeracy coaches or numeracy leaders and they're working well need to be able to fund that position. So how do you find the funding for an extra body in schools? Now some of the schools have decided that the role is so important, um, they decided that you might have 20 kids on the roll as listed as coming into your classroom. But with the issues around attendance, teachers know that it's unlikely that they're going to get 20 kids in their classroom every day. So what they've decided to do at that school is to say, we'll have 25 kids in our classroom, knowing full well it's unlikely that we'll ever get 25, but we might have 16 or 15. That's still a manageable number. And what they've done, because schools are funded on the number of kids to the number of teachers they get, so they've made their classes look like they're bigger and they've been able to allocate that funding, take a, basically take a teacher off class and then allocate that funding to a numeracy coach. Other schools are saying we can't do it because they're sticking with the, the, the old model of number of kids per school. So I think it's very um, creative as to how some schools are thinking about how the importance um, and the impact of that role. The other thing is making sure you have the right person for the role. So going back to some of the schools are very hard to staff. Um, we went to one school just recently and it was 100 k's off the border for a special amount of funding. So the next school, it was 100 k's down the road. Those teachers got free housing. They got a, a much larger remote allowance. They got free flights home every term, whereas 100 k's down the road, this school got none of that. So how do you attract the teachers to come to school A when school B, 100 k's down, and when you're remote, 100 k's is you know, a quick, road, quick trip down the road. So how do you attract teachers to go to that school A, but moreover, how do you get the right person in that role? So the schools often have unique challenges in terms of attracting people to the schools. The other thing that's really clear is that how do you support the learning of the middle leader themselves? Teachers generally have a nice bag of tricks um, that work really well. If they stay in that school for too long um, and the other teachers stay in the school for too long, where do they get their professional growth from? Um, and I think this is probably going to be the biggest challenge into the future when we're recognising already that the numeracy leader does have a, a really important role to play in those schools. But how do we make sure the numeracy leader is actually upskilled more so that they can work with their teachers in a better way? Um, and I think this is probably one of the big challenges is we know um, governments are really cutting back on professional development and it's here's the CD, here's how you do it, but is the CD um, or rem remote support as valuable as face-to-face. -face. Many of the schools, for example, um, Asalana can attest, it might take us, we had one, one we were trying to get the report back um, and Alana had left, I don't know, eight or 10 phone messages and I don't know how many emails we sent. And then one day they just rang us up after we sent them another reminder, most apologetic, they had not got one phone call and they had not got one of our emails. And we find that a lot. So what the what we take for granted in urban settings does not necessarily apply in remote settings. I used to have this vision at my college that the emails would be running between the two relay stations and at the bottom was this big pile of emails that was just sitting there. You'd send them, 
They never got them. Um, a cloudy day or a windy day, the satellites didn't work and the email didn't work. So I think that some of these are the, some of the bigger challenges that we've got in terms of how do we make sure if we can get a good person as a numeracy leader who does all of this great work, how do we make sure that they're always upskilled? Because if they're upskilled, then they can work with the teachers. But if their skill set isn't improving or expanding, then how do they keep working with their teachers in new and novel ways? I think it does, um, but, and again, we've got, because we've got such diversity across the schools, we have had one school where the new principal came in and had been in other remote communities, and in most remote communities you can't send homework home because it doesn't come back, or if you send books home you don't, or, or getting permission slips. I mean, we don't interview the kids in this project because it would be very unlikely that we'd get permission slips back or it would create a workload on the teachers. So in some schools, um, the way they do that is in this one school, they could send homework at home and there was an expectation that from the community that they would send that back. Other schools, the way they worked around it was they had a maths backpack and they would send home the maths backpack. It was, it was a little kit that had a ruler and all other sorts of things that they, the kids could take home. And it was a really prized possession to get the maths kit to take it home. So it was something novel rather than something that was expected. Um, in other schools, what they would do is have like a family Friday um, and they'd get the parents to come in. So the school would stagger their day. They'd have the Friday morning session. Then the kids would have a break. They'd come back in the afternoon and they'd have a movie night because there's in many of the remote communities, there's no entertainment, so the school provided that. They'd have a movie night, and with that, they'd make sure that they had displays around, they had activities that parents could do about what the kids were doing in the classroom. So there were ways that schools were doing it, but I think the example I gave of the, the school that was doing the consistent approach and having those big blocks of trying to always consolidate some of those concepts was the other way that it was being done. Um, having said that, there was another school that we've worked in um, and they had an amazing set of um, Aboriginal education workers and what they did was they made resources. So they made big books, they made um, books to take home, they'd changed songs, all sorts of things that would bring in the home language and then the mathematical language. So if there were terms like um, underneath this or next door to or all of those positional terms um, which aren't in the home language um, but they had Creole to describe that. They would have that in uh, the Creole, but in, say in red in the text, and then they'd have behind, and that would, so the kids could see quite clearly what the Creole t cluster of terms were and what the mathematical term were. So there's ways that schools have been doing it quite innovatively. And there's other schools that they just don't know how to do it. So that's why the, I think this project is really good because it gives practical examples of what schools are doing to make it work. I was, I've been very, very pleasantly surprised about the almost lack of, I won't say there was, there was a lack of, but the, again, it comes back to me rethinking what that envisioned level is. Um, every school, I'm pretty sure I can say every school has adopted the high expectations discourse and we will not use deficit discourse at these schools. And you didn't hear, um, teachers framing, these kids can't do. What they had, had reframed it as, it's my responsibility to find out what the kids can do. So the data has become very important. So it's my job to find out what the kids can do and then scaffold their learning from there. Whereas previously, in many of the schools I've worked in, which this project's been just fantastic for this, is that they'd say, oh no, these kids can't do this, and these kids can't do that. Now we did hear from other schools, the schools, many of them said when we came in, and I'll give you a, a, nice, class, a, a nice example, they went to the school and many of, the, many of the kids, I mean we talk about attendance issues, many of these schools have kids who are t attending more than 80% of the time, many of the kids are t attending 100%.
Um, now, that's not to say there are those there are other groups of kids who don't attend. Um, but they said they had kids who were t attending nearly 100% of their time. The, their parents were working in all the different government agencies um, and holding down you know, the, the regular jobs. And yet these kids were not getting a C. And they just said, well, why is that the case? These kids should be at benchmark. Um, and so what they did was they, they worked with the teachers and what they found the teachers were doing was working with deficit discourses. So some of the kids were working, say, in Year 10, they were working at um, Grade 3 level. And so what they've done is they said, if these kids are working in Year 10, we will work from the National Curriculum. They should be doing Algebra. Let's start with Algebra. And then, so most of the kids can do Algebra. And what they've done is they've changed that whole discourse around. So many of the schools have started with staff who have been... Uh, working in um, a deficit discourse and changed it dramatically. Now, some of the other schools have been very proactive. Many of the schools are public independent schools or independent schools. So they've got some control over who is allowed in the school. Some of the states have also got policies now that if you come into um, a remote school, once a remote school might have been where you couldn't get a job anywhere else. And so departments are trying to change that. So principals can say, for example, you can do it the UC way, or don't come here at all. If you're not prepared to do it our way, it's the highway. And they're quite ruthless about it, which means they have to buy in to the high expectations. And some of them have done the um, Chris Sara work, but many of them haven't. And some of them... Scott Burridge is on the project. Okay. So yeah. Project, yeah. So, yeah. So some of them have had the impact of Chris Sara, some of them haven't. But many of them, I think... Um, have got leaders who just will not buy into the discourse. And I just say, Aboriginal kids can learn like everybody else. We've got to find a way to make that happen. And that's been a really positive part of it. I have, we haven't been into one school that we've seen that disc, de the deficit discourse working. Yeah, which has been nice. Most of the teachers that are coming into the school are not prepared to be, a, or not prepared from their pre-service course to differentiate. They don't know how to differentiate. Um, so they come in and they've got this huge diversity in their classroom and they don't know what to do. So that's why I think this numeracy coach role is so critical because that, that teacher's generally been a very experienced teacher, maybe in a mainstream school, a very experienced teacher, maybe in the remote context, but they are an experienced teacher. So they've got a better sense of how to differentiate. But they've got to have the content knowledge, they've got to have the pedagogical content knowledge, and they've got to know what that data says. So um, having that data has been really critical across working out what kids do know as opposed to what they don't know, and then building that from there. But for me, what has been really important is that the differentiation occurs in ways that are subtle that the other kids don't pick it up. So um, one of the schools had this thing called a magic worksheet and it was just, so all of them looked exactly the same. And so I got my magic number, you got your magic number, you got your magic number, Tom, you know, we all got them. Some kids might have been working with fractions, some might have been working with decimals, some might have been working with two and three and others were working with millions. But for all intents and purposes, when the kids looked at it, they all thought they were doing the same sheet. So there were lots of those really good strategies. There was a lot of group work that was also done, um, and I think that's really important. So where I started off saying that, you know, some teachers don't think it's important, group work's been really important for differentiation as well. So kids often don't know, and the teachers will say they don't always use um, ability grouping, which I'm personally dead against, but you could, the argument was we will do it sometimes, but other times we will use mixed ability grouping as well, because it's important for the kids to work with each other. But also there's different um, community politics too, that you know there might be some fighting with this mob and that mob, so the next day you can't put those kids in the same group. So there's a cultural awareness that goes around that as well. So differentiation is, is absolutely critical, which I com think comes back to having the high expectations. You can have high expectations, but if you can't scaffold, to meet those high expectations, it's not going to work. So what we have seen in terms of the language part, um, many of the schools in the early years, they'll have a very strong early years program. Some of them, uh, schools are actually going back to almost 
the, the mother in the womb type of thing, getting the mums to come into school, feel comfortable with it, having play groups so that kids are comfortable with it. They're becoming schooled in school behaviour. So by the time they're hitting kindy or prep or whatever it's called in the different states, they know how to work in school so that they're actually able to go. But they're also scaffolding a lot about language. Um, and how to use blocks, how to use counters, how to um, sort by colour. All of those things that are often just taken for granted. So a lot of the schools um, are actually used, because there's not a lot happens in many of the communities anyway, so it's a nice way for all the families and communities to get together. So there's a lot of that work that's being done. So in some of those communities, the differentiation isn't, and I'll say that, it isn't as big or as broad as what it used to be, because the kids are coming to school, school ready and maths ready. Most, and I'm not sure what we do here, um, but most universities are governed by what is outside of, like a, the teacher registration body, and they will say you have to do or incorporate an Indigenous studies subject. But often the Indigenous studies subject is a more generic subject, um, and they, that might be about understanding culture, um, understanding the history, those sorts of issues, um, understanding the different um, fights that have, and I mean political struggles, that have been going on in terms of Indigenous studies. There's very little work that's actually done, well, what does that actually look like in a literacy classroom or a numeracy classroom? So we can be aware of the bigger issues, but what does that actually mean if you're in, say, the central desert area of Northern Territory, as opposed to the Kimberley, where they speak a Creole, as opposed to um, a school in Adelaide, that's bringing kids from in all, all, all over the country in. Um, so there's, there's the big issue, um, but there's also the very pragmatic stuff about what you actually do at the level of the classroom. And there's not a lot of that, the latter one. And that's where a lot of the teachers end up breaking because they can't, they can't deal with it. And that's why we see a lot of the high turnover. There is, but often the connections can be really, really... It's a bit like, you know, when you get on a mobile phone sometimes and it keeps breaking up. Mm -hmm. That's often how it is in those remote sites. Um, as I just gave that one example, and there's, there's all of them. Um, all of them will have troubles with... Exercise the frustration. Yeah. Um, and even if you're putting too much on a website where they can download video or, or the, the streaming can be really slow or sporadic and that becomes very frustrating too. There's, uh, there's, there's a whole lot of thinking that has to be done around it. <laughs>